I'm a graduating PhD from UIUC, and uh, as Jiawei mentioned, I'm visiting Stanford and will be joining USC Computer Science Department as a faculty member. And uh, I'm just um, appreciate the chance because it's really lucky for me to be here. Our flight, it took me over 20 hours with four connecting flights from the west coast of the North America to this uh, very east coast where it's only like seven hours to the Euro, um, but it's like eight hours to the uh, west coast. Um, so I will be sharing with you about um, our study on how to make sense of massive text data. And that's the thing of this talk. Um, and I will be talking about why these structures are so useful and important to um, the data mining community, as well as many other communities, including natural language processing. Plus, I will show you some techniques that we try to make this process very automatic. That means we try to um, get rid of extensive human efforts. So um, turning data into knowledge is one of the most intriguing challenges in the big data age. And we already seen great success in mining knowledge from data that are structured. Things like spreadsheets, information networks, databases, and so on. But turning data, um, especially unstructured data like text data, um, which is the majority of the data we are collecting today, like over 80%, um, into knowledge is a much harder problem. Not to mention, I mean, so people here want to sort of make this unstructured text data into sort of structured form so then we can apply tons of exciting data mining and database techniques on top of them. Another point is we really want to make this process to be uh, like a um, machine taking the lead instead of, instead of human taking the lead, which means we want to make this really fast, scalable, so then we can just repeatedly working on different vertical domains and different downstream applications. But what are the structures that I'm talking about? Just to give you one general example here, Google's knowledge graph is a way that we can structure test data into sort of knowledge. For example, you have um, da Vinci is the entities where surrounding these entities, you can find out it's also um, have different relationships with other entities like Mona Lisa and so on. Those are the entity entity relationships, but what, moreover, even just looking at the Da Vinci, you will see there's different attribute and the attribute values associated with, for example, the date of birth, um, the day of death, and many other things. And to just give you one more concrete example here, so this is a piece of text that talking about Da Vinci, we grab it, we grab it from the Wikipedia and many other sources. And we want to just turn this piece, we want just machines to read this piece of text and try to find out, okay, there's different types of entities in this piece of text, like um, um, Leonardo, Don Finzi, and uh, Mona Lisa, and also you figure out, okay, um, Da Vinci actually paint the Mona Lisa, this um, work, and also there's different values associated with um, Da Vinci, like the day of birth and day of uh, death, and so on. So that was the general idea, um, what are the structures that we are focusing on? Basically, we want different types of entities and different relationships between these entities and also their attribute uh, and the value of those attributes. Uh, but then in real life, how these structures actually facilitate in our like, daily products. So this example is a real example that we're working with the TripAdvisor engineers. So they want to find out interesting collection of hotels, which means hotels they tend to be grouped together because they share very similar characteristics like the surrounding restaurants, um, the facilities, the locations, and so on. And they want to do this without using the metadata of those business or, rest or hotels. They don't look at the GPS coordinates of them. They're just using the review text. They want to do this, make, make this happen. So what, what is happening on the line is we run our algorithm to extract the um, different kinds of entities from the review text, those free texts. Um, things like the hotel names, the uh, location names, the per even the person names, the restaurant names, and the many attributes of the hotel, like the, um, when people are talking about like, the locations, the convenience, and so on. And we're using this sort of a structure um, here. For example, we are talking about entities. We're using them as the feature in a sort of downstream clustering algorithm and try to find out a bunch of hotel um, um, collections, like catch and show collection, basically talking about a hotel that are 
uh, near this um, New, York, um, New, New York City uh, Broadway shows area. And we are using the features such like the Bacon Theater, the um, um, Radio City Music Hall, those kind of structure feature to make this um, cluster happen. Another example is near the High Line, which are basically the bunch of the hotels that are across um, along the High Line attraction. And that was an example about our real life products. What about um, science? Um, we also think we we also deal with tons of literature. We need to read. Uh, we need to dig out a bunch of um, most relevant papers for tons of literature, and we also want to um, try to grab the core ideas or the important piece of information from those papers, and want to make this um, to be less um, expensive for human to um, conduct. And what has happened here is we try to dig out the entities, the relationship between those biomedical entities and their attributes from just the reviews app chats. And we use those act, uh, structures to index these papers. So then now we can allow user to use a new way to sort of navigate the knowledge within this literature. Like if they're looking for multiple genes that are associated with a certain disease or disease type, they can just put out a bunch of gene names and those diseases. And underlying the engine is actually um, knowing what is happening. So they sort of make the guess that, okay, this bunch of genes is representing such a, a subgraph relation between these genes and the disease. And then they use this substructure, go back to the uh, gigantic knowledge graph to dig out the most relevant papers and present them back to the users. And this was just two examples about how this structure actually facilitated the outer, our uh, daily life and the uh, science, scientific research. So think about you can just use this structure to make um, semantic search, uh, structure exploration easy to happen on any sort of text corpora, text documents. And you can apply the graph mining and network analysis techniques that are so exciting in the social media uh, um, data. Now you can apply them to any sort of free text data and not to mention the uh, facet taxonomy construction or just using this structure as sort of the features in a downstream machine learning application. But if we're looking at what the prior art has been doing um, in digging out these structures from free tax or from the Mexican tax corpora, we think it's adopting a very um, um, like human effort, expensive um, um, manner. So it's taking human effort in a repeat way. So here's the workflow of the traditional um, um, pipeline. So if you are dealing with a specific corpus, let's say New York Times News, and you want to dig out person names, location names, organization names, so you first want to find a bunch of experts that really knows about um, these seven kind of things. Let's say you are dealing with biomedical papers, and um, you want to dig out gene names, uh, pathways, and so on. You want to find those biomedical experts. And after you get these experts, you ask them to sample a bunch of documents out of the entire huge corpus and annotate the corpus sentence by sentence, token by token, for those entity names of different types. And using this label data as sort of a training data in the downstream machine learning pipeline or build up extraction rules, and those machine learning models, let it be deep neural nets or just logistic regression or SVM, they work pretty well on this particular corpus. But think about day zero, you are dealing with New York Times corpus. And then the other day, you want to switch to legal documents, restaurant reviews, biomedical papers. You basically need to repeat the whole process all over again. And this is what we call the repeated human efforts. And that's exactly something we want to avoid by proposing our solution. And here's the, our solution. And we call it sort of an effort line structure mining or structure mine. The basic idea is we still want to leverage human knowledge, but the human knowledge is not conducted in a very direct way. It's not a direct supervision. It's a sort of an indirect or like implicit supervision coming from the knowledge basis. The knowledge basis is being constantly updated with, by the human crowds with their knowledge um, towards the world. So they keep updating Wikipedia, like biomedical experts keep putting new facts they explore in their experiments back to the mesh ontologies, to the UMLS databases. And in every vertical domain, such things happen. People keep enrich those, um, those knowledge bases. So we want to just use the facts already been stored in those knowledge bases as our starting point. 
and we want to map this knowledge back to the corpus that we are dealing with. Either it's uh, New York Times corpus or it's Yelp reviews, we map it back and we try to automatically generate label data in a very um, um, large scale way. So there's, there's a dilemma here. We are generating label data in a very large scale, but we are also producing the label arrows or the like arrow prone labels in a sort of a large scale way. And that will be the challenge we, we're gonna talk about. But as you can see, if we're taking such a workflow, we're gonna easily <coughs> produce label data for different vertical domain, as long as you know what will be the best knowledge basis for that vertic vertical domain to be looking at. So we're talking about biomedical domain, we're talking about general domain. You have Wikipedia, you have those databases. But even you are just a company that working on your internal um, um, documents, you may have your own dictionaries about some of the in interesting um, uh, terminologies or concepts that you already be curated and stored without public access. But our approach should be applied in a very similar way to your case as well. So we, we can see the foundation of this workflow, this effort I structure my, is, is solely based on the um, access, accessibility of those uh, existing knowledge bases or the private dictionaries that you keep. And the reason why we are so into this sort of a workflow is because we are being witness a very great growth of such um, resource which captured the human knowledge about a war and uh, it's been constantly updated in a very impressive speed as you can see here. So we want to take this to save humans direct supervision on the documents. So we call it sort of an in indirect supervision and we also think it's a more automatic way of extracting structure from the documents. Like document, like the structures of entity names or entity types or the relations. Um, but there's lots of challenges if we want to adopt such a very intuitive pipeline. The first thing is the data sparsity issues. So you know we have tons of knowledge bases and we know lots of things has already been curated and stored in those knowledge bases, but that's far from complete. Um, when I say complete, actually I mean two things. The third thing is the fact may not even exist in the knowledge bases. Let's say you talk about a restaurant names, but you don't see the restaurant actually being um, recorded in our Wikipedia. That's maybe just people don't think they are important. So that's something we are missing from our Wikipedia or knowledge base. And you won't expect we can map them back to the corpus using our workflow. Another, re another factor is our techniques try to map things from knowledge base back to the corpus. It's still amateur. I'm talking about entity resolution, entity disambiguation, and entity linking those two kits. You know we have been working, putting so much effort in improving them, but we still see a very poor record for those kind of systems. So together, we just do a very um, like rough study across three kinds of corpora to see what's the percentage of the facts um, in the corpus actually can be successfully mapped to the knowledge bases to further understand their structure types like the entity types or the relation with other um, entities. We found out that, okay, in New York Times is, is, is less than 20%. In other two corpus, Yelp's review and um, tweets is even lower. So this is far than satisfactory. So essentially we want to look at this um, shadow area. That's something we got, which is less than 20%, which we call matchable part. Matchable means you can find out, any, you can map the entity back to the knowledge bases, grab the entity types. You can see, okay, these two entities express some relationships um, as it's ex already expressed in the knowledge bases. So it's pretty small, it's pretty tiny uh, portion. But we want to go from this shadow part to the vast majority of the unshadow part. And that's the major technical innovation we try to address in our technology here. So there's two things we need to do. Um, one is we need to do the expansion from the shadow part to the remaining um, unmatchable part. And this means you need to use some bridges to propagate the information from one to the other. 
and the bridges in the context of text documents will be the context words or any sort of a context engrams, which we will introduce them shortly. Another thing I have mentioned, this distance supervision heuristics is pretty, um, it's pretty um, aggressive in the sense that they assign labels in a very agnostic way. They will introduce lots of false positive labels. They will introduce also false negative labels. So basically, you are getting a massive amount of label in a very poor quality. So the, towards building the model, the challenge becomes how do you build a model that are aware of such errors in the label? So basically, you should not model the problem as a very traditional supervised learning manner that you treat every label as perfect and you want to fit the best neural networks on the bunch of labels you have. But you need to treat them as sort of weak supervision that you need to pick the right label for each instance by looking at their surrounding context. And you want to find such a model that can be aware of such uh, circumstance. That's something we want to do here. And the, the key is we do have a huge corpus, um, as I mentioned. And the huge corpus means lots of data redundancy. The data redundancy will become a key to sort of help you find out when you see the conflicts of the labels, you, want to, you, you, you are able to pick the right label among them. And when you see uh, very sparse data, you can use this data redundancy to propagate information from the linkable one to the unlinkable one. So that was the high level um, conceptual ideas of how things work. But this is a more like a, uh, a detailed view of our technologies. So we start from a huge corpus in a specific domain, let's say New York Times corpus or Yelp's reviews, and we have the right knowledge basis to use associated with that corpus. That's our assumption. Definitely you will ask the question that, okay, if I'm dealing with a bunch of legal documents, could you give me a legal databases? So, I mean, if your firm don't have this dictionary, then um, we should think of other ways or we should find out a, a new model that can be um, 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 dealing with this sort of uh, out of database or out of knowledge basis um, cases. But let's assume we have the right data knowledge basis and the co a huge corpus. The first thing we want to do is we want to actually find out the useful um, engrams or what we call quality phrases from the text sequence in the documents. And those phrases is representing either those entity names like person names, restaurant names, hotel names, or it's just some useful context units surrounding these entity names that can be later used as the bridges to propagate information. And starting in that, we have two routes. One route is representing the close, sort of a, a closed domain um, point of view that we think we have a very predefined, finite, and fixed set of type to deal with. For example, maybe you have a 14 entity types that you are focusing on, or 100 relation types that you're focusing on. Then we can do the task, what we call typing. We can type the entity names with their right um, label. We can type the relation between a pair of entity names by looking at their context. But if you are taking an open um, domain assumption, then we need to also consider you actually don't know what exactly the entity type or relation type you are looking at or the attribute type. So you need to discover these attributes together with their values. For example, you need to know, okay, date of birth is actually a valid attribute for person type, person entity, and you also need to dig out the exact date for the person. Um, so now you have the um, typing and the meta pattern driven attribute name and value discovery. And from there, you can get a bunch of any typed entities, typed relationships, and the attributes. So we also showed you a bunch of exciting applications by using these text structures, sort of prove them they can be used to facilitate scientific research and do a lot of interesting text mining application. And here's the overview of the uh, entire tutorial. We, we just talk about the background of the problem and give a little bit of introduction. And, and Jiawei will be talking about the first part, which is the phrase mining um, 
and, and NAD extraction, and I will be talking about typing entities and relations. And then we'll rotate back to Java to talk about this attribute discovery. And I will talk a little bit, uh, and Java will also cover the um, application um, by using these text structures. And I will come back to conclude and show you some interesting future directions. So I will just pass to Jiawei. Okay, so now it's my turn. So uh, the first thing I want to discuss is the part one. Okay, the part one, like uh, what uh, Xiang just mentioned, uh, I'll do part one, then he will come back to part two, I will do part three and part four, and he will conclude. Okay, so that's the general uh, one. So this part one, essentially, we call entity extraction through phrase mining. So I will first give you introduction, what is phrase mining, what is entity extraction. Then we'll get into why this process should be fully automated. Okay. So if you look at these several function blocks, what we are covering now is the first function block we call automatic phrase mining methods. Okay. What is phrase mining? Okay. Freeze mining means we got a very large corpus. Okay, you get a strings, all the different words. But the, the single word in many cases may not be an independent semantic unit. Just give you an example, like data mining. Data mining actually two words, okay? Data and mining. Okay. Actually, if you, in the early days when you say uh, data mining, then people did not know what. They say, are you joining the mining industry? They were thinking you're really doing coal mine or gold mine, right? So that, that means single individual one does not really make full sense. When you get together, it makes a lot of sense. Freeze mining means you try to, from the very large corpus, you try to dig out those phrases. Okay, you think those are the very meaningful ones, and you actually, based on the, some quality measure, you can, you can sort them. You can say this, you know, of course, one and number one, number two probably will not make too much sense, but number, you know, once you get 10,000 or a million, and these are the top ones, it does mean, you know, this part will make it really good phrases. The other one may not be that good phrases, okay. So, uh, the phrase mining, like I just said, it is definitely very useful. You think about it, you, when you do question answering, when you do document analysis, you do anything. Indexing, you want to index phrases. You think about it, when you read any book, you have the index. In most cases, those indexes are, and this is actually phrases, right? Just give you a simple example. If, if I say united, okay? Uh, of course, I haven't said what, what it is. You actually do not really know. If I go to airport, I say United. You probably say, that's United Airlines. What about I go to United Nations? So you do not even know whether it's the United States or United Kingdom, United Nations, or many more, right? So that means you really want to find, dig out what is the meaningful ones, okay? And how we judge the quality of the phrases. Within very large corpus, you actually, the first thing is you think about something occur together very frequently. The frequency is one measure. You know, it's more frequent together, like United Airlines or United States, you think those are the frequencies, okay? The second one actually is very important called concordance. That means even they are frequent, but sometimes they barely get together, okay? But some, they, they naturally get together. So just give you an example, okay. In many cases, you get tea, you say I want a strong tea, okay. But nobody said I want a powerful tea, right? Strong and powerful may be very, very close. But you get a, a computer, you say I need a powerful computer, nobody said I need a strong computer, right? So that's the way, you know, you get together naturally. It's like active learning, okay. The, you know, passive learning, active learning. You get together, it does make sense, okay? So we call this as concordance. Concordance actually can be measured in many different ways. I can first give you a very simple way like Z-score, okay? Or significance scores. Or some people can use PMI, some people can use like chi-square. You know, there are lots of different measures. Actually, all these measures to some extent make sense 
in many cases, it generates something very consistent, very coherent. The third one is informativeness. What is informativeness? That means they get together very frequent, but probably you do not think it's a really good phrase because they're just too popular. For example, you read a paper, this, is, this paper says, or this paper e explains, or something. You think this, this paper does not really make a meaningful phrase just because they are too popular. It's like a stop words. You can think these are the stop phrases. The last one called completeness. Completeness means you, you think any fragment, because you get a long phrase with, say, seven words. Any one you chop together, they are also frequent together. But it doesn't really make too much sense, because you want the most complete one, like support vector machine. You get a support vector, you get a vector, you get a vector machine. Probably the vector machine may not make too much sense rather than support vector machine. Okay. So the completeness is that measure. Then, uh, over the years, we got a, quite a few pieces of work. We really like it. Okay. The reason later you probably can see, the one important reason is you really do not need human supervision or very little human su supervision. And it works not only for like English. Actually, this one, because it, you based on those statistics, it works almost for any languages. You later, you will, you will see why. For example, you can work on Chinese, you can work on Spanish. We're going to show you the different languages, how the, you can get it, why it all works fine, okay. So, but if you say, you said it's where, how you can prove it really works? The best proof is we just give it to you, right? So. If you look at this, majority, like especially the later one, top mind, sec phrase, out phrase, all the source code, including some you know, data sets or some you know, papers and also associated explanation, everything is public. Right? It's on the GitHub. We actually give you the GitHub uh, addresses. So you can download them. Okay? And they actually also use in many places just give you an example, like uh, the sec phrase, the first author, Jia Lu Liu, he got a PhD at UIC, now he's in Google research. Okay, actually, you probably can see the Google grab him because he made a really good con contribution. Okay. Actually, even Xiang, uh, in Microsoft research, he actually introduced this sec phrase to Microsoft as well. Uh, one interesting thing could be, you probably know TripAdvisor. Okay, TripAdvisor, uh, they actually sent us an email, uh, give us a block link, said they tried so many tools, then finally they found this sec phrase, plus a little embedding, it really works so nicely for TripAdvisor, not only for one language, you probably know TripAdvisor is very international, anybody can travel, okay. So they, 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 it really works nicely. So that's a proof, industry actually really like it, okay. So you, you, you probably can try this thing because you know, it, it really works and source code, every, all the explanation uh, are there. So you, you really can download and play with it. Actually, to help you to learn this, we actually published an electronic book, e-book by uh, Morgan Claypool. You, you, actually, anybody in university, probably your university, John my, Morgan Claypool, you can download them. You can download the whole PDF, the, uh, you, you, it's an introduction on all those things, plus they have those GitHub addresses as well. You actually can, can follow that, you can download it, okay. So uh, that gives you a very uh, good motivation why you want to learn this, right, because you really can use it. Now I will give you a little introduction how this whole thing evolved. Uh, I will show you what is a supervised method for phrase mining? Okay. What is completely unsupervised method? What is weekly or distant, distantly supervised method? You probably can see the philosophy in machine learning actually is penetrating into this phrase mining as well. Okay. So we first look at the supervised phrase mining. Supervised means human. Actually, you need to do something. You need to give a lot of like, uh, supervision on different aspects, then you finally can get a good phrases. The supervision 
A very important one is parsing. Okay, if you've got natural language phrases, you can parse them, you can build a tree, and non-phrase chunking is another supervised method. You can do POS tagging and all of these things. Okay. Then uh, to rank those supervised, uh, even supervised extractive phrases, to rank them, there are methods like C-value, text rank, or TF-IDF. Okay. So let's first look at supervised, which I uh, always say we are not fully promote this one because you need a lot of human labor. Right? But if you look at supervised method, the first one is parsing. Okay. You probably know there are lots of very nice parsers. In natural language processing, uh, parsing is a very, very good or very typical you know, technology. Uh, you can do some uh, simple par parsing, you get noun phrase, verb phrases, you can go down. Then at the down part, you see, see they are nicely deep into your parse tree. That's phrases. For example, the chef or the soup. Okay, those are the phrases. Okay. And uh, the parsing, there are some semantic parsing as well. Okay. And another one is chunking. Chunking, usually people are using called noun phrase chunking. Uh, what you do is you do some tokenization, then you do those part of speech, or some people just simply call POS, part of speech tagging to those sentences. That means you, you try to first find every token, like here is a we saw the yellow dog. Okay. So then you uh, first get token, and with those token you do those part of speech, you can find noun phrases, verb, and the other noun phrases, finally, based on this, you can find good phrases, okay? But that method, since it's supervised, you need a really human to do a, a lot of curation, a lot of labeling, which may not be very scalable. Just thinking about this. Now we have lots of people play with tweets, okay? Or, you know, you do Yelp, you know, there are so many, you know, like uh, social media stuff. People write even not following very rigorous grammar. Okay. And plus, people may use some jargons or something. So those things, actually, it's very hard for everybody to give you labels. So that means you go to a new domain, like a medical science, or you go to social media, those training may not be available. Okay. And another thing is, if you want to do this, because even you think about parsing or tokenization or POS tagging, and all those tricks, you try to find phrases, the computation also reasonably slow, okay? And uh, so we call these, uh, is those training, substantial training based one, may not be a really good one, right? So you want to see whether we can say, without people giving label, whether we can do something really good. And uh, the ranking, you probably can see the C value is try to find the maximum phrases based on popularity and completeness. Uh, all these features, all these, uh, you know, like uh, uh, criteria, also actually used in the unsupervised or, or distance supervised one, right? So let's first look at, you know, we put more attention on the other two methods, because that two methods, you need research, and then this method actually can work for multiple languages. Okay. So let's first look at the unsupervised method. Unsupervised method is mainly based on this statistic measure. Actually, it's a very simple stat statistic measure. If you look at the, st the, the first thing, like a popularity, you just need a content, okay? You just need to get something like a, simple frequent patterns, right? The, those are the frequent pattern mining or distribution based on frequency distribution. Those simple methods can get a, the counting one done. The concordance one essentially is like a z-score. Those things getting together is, is much more than expected, okay? The completeness one is just say you get a sub, substring, superstring, you just see which one is more complete based on the frequency, based on all these, you can find it, okay? So, uh, the first thing is whether you want to get a raw frequency or you want to get uh, some frequency which actually, uh, just give you a simple example, okay? 
the raw frequency is as long as they appear. Okay, if I just to say support vector machine. Not only you see support vector machine, you may see vector machine. Okay, but you probably see in computer science. Anytime I say vector machine, you probably say, no, no, no. I think you mean support vector machine. That means the vector machine actually they do not appear independently. Because almost every time you get a vector machine, you get a support vector machine. Okay. In this corpus, in the computer science corpus, the vector machine is not complete. But support vector machine is complete. Okay. Later we're going to see how to compute this. But this is really corpus dependent. For example, you really go down to, say, like uh, electrical engineering or even mechanical engineering, maybe this vector machine does make sense, right? So that, that really depends on what corpus you're dealing with. Then another important thing is you, you, you can see the, the last one. We actually uh, give you a different color this different color actually uh, does make some sense, okay? People actually, in the past, I, I think you probably, uh, somebody saw, I think there's a one quite well-cited archive paper, okay, by David Bly and John Lafferty, okay? These two are big pillar in, in, in topic model, you know, in statistic, uh, you know, those uh, model analysis. What they do is they first do topic model, okay? They find all the different topics. Then they still want to find phrase within the topic. You think it makes sense within the topic find phrases. But actually, when you do topic, very likely if you do individual word to do topic, just give you like this one, okay? Knowledge discovery. Okay. It, it, of course, I call knowledge discovery, you think it's a phrase. But the machine does not know it. Machine may take a knowledge as one topic, okay. Discovery as another topic, okay. You, you look at a support vector machine, you probably immediately see. Machine, if you independently just look at the machine, it could be mechanical engineering, right? Vector may be mass or physics. And support even could be politics, right? Support of Hillary or, or Trump, right? So if this went into three different topics, how, what's the chance the three topics you can get together, right, as a, a phrase? Okay, you probably can see, you immediately break up. There is no way you can get support vector machine as a phrase. That means you first do topic model before you do phrase mining, it may not work, okay. So, uh, the frequency, another important thing is you need to see the distribution. The distribution means you actually need to see within your corpus, what things getting together frequently or what things getting together unexpectedly frequent, okay? So let's look at so-called unexpected frequent, okay? So finding uh, f frequency, uh, I assume no matter you know significant score or some PMI, everybody I assume you know Z-score, okay? Z-score basically is, you, you get a no, the, the normal distribution, the Gaussian distribution, right? Uh, we know actually if you get three standard deviation away, the chance to go beyond that is only 0.3%, that if you get really standard deviation, right? And that three, no matter it's top three or bottom three per, uh, standard deviation, Z-score is plus three or minus three, okay? So that's a Z-score. So, Assume you came from Mars. You, do, you, 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 could, you could not make sense about reading English. Okay. But how could you find phrases? You just think about this. Suppose these Martians bring a powerful computer. Okay. They can count very quickly. Okay. Then you can find phrases. Why? You think about this. If you can count very, very frequently, we just still take support vector machine as an example. Okay, let, let, let me just uh, get in, into this one, okay. Suppose the Martian came to the Earth, look at the computer science research publications like DBRP, okay. There are two million titles like this, okay. Then how could you find support vector machines as a phrase, okay. 
actually, it can, if the Martian bring a computer, it can count. Okay. So the counting can really help you to find phrases. Why? You think about this. Okay. Suppose you got support. You count, say, one over a thousand chance to get support. Vector, you get one over a thousand chance to get, get a vector. Okay. So if they really have nothing to do with each other, okay, you think of a normally support vector getting together, the chance is one over a million, right? Now you count it. You count it, say support vector getting together is much, much more frequent than one over a million because you get two million titles. One over a million means it only happened twice in your whole corpus, right? This happened much more, okay? How much more? You look at z-score, okay, distribution. If this one is, say, 12 standard deviation away, you know, three standard deviation away chance to get together is 0.3%. If 12 standard deviation away, how do you explain it? The only explanation is they glue together, right? That means they are really phrase, right? So you probably can see, that's a very simple counting can help Martians find all the phrases on the Earth, right? So you probably can see, that's why it works not only for English, it works for any language, right? So, that's the general philosophy, okay? Another one we put on a small corner is say when you count, you have to do a little segmentation. That means if you count, you will say, oh, vector machine is also very frequent. It's vector machine glued together, so why vector machine you don't count as a phrase, okay? Why you can't support vector machine as a phrase? Actually, when you do counting, you, you see this vector machine, you want to see them go independent of the whole phrase support vector machine. Okay. That means you go back, you say, now I can count the longer one, I can count the shorter one. Okay. The longer one actually will trump the shorter one because likely this is, we want a complete one. We take support vector machine, the whole thing, counting. Once we count it, originally you, you individually count vector machine. Now you say, no, they are, not in, they are not independent. I don't count them, okay? So you go back to that phrase, you say, vector machine, the count should be deduced because it's taken by support vector machine. That's why you have a raw frequency and you have rectified, adjusted frequency. Once you rectify it, the vector machine frequency become really, really low. They cannot be independent, so vector, vector machine actually is gone, but support vector machine is there. You probably can see why you can do this correctly. Okay. And actually, the interesting thing is, I think about two or three years ago, uh, David Bly actually got a distinguished speech in our department. He came to my office, we were chatting. And I told him, I said, we can do freeze mining. I showed just exactly this, this uh, slide. He was very surprised. He said, how could you get this? Okay. And we say, uh, I said, uh, we are doing concordance. He said, we tried, we're also doing concordance. But I told them we have two more tricks. Okay. One trick is we first do not do topic modeling. Okay. We first do phrase mining, then do topic modeling. Because I read David Bly's paper, they first do topic modeling, then within each topic they do phrase mining. Actually, you can see the support vector machine, you will never get it, okay? So the second one is segmentation, freezer segmentation. That, that means we actually go inside, get a real frequency, real rectify frequency out, that's why Quickly, we can get into this one. You can see, this is just from the Yelp review. You, you, you can see all these, actually it's very naturally getting phrases. And then you do topic model, you really do very good topic model. You look at the first one, say, ice cream, iced tea, French toast, hash brown, you almost go to McDonald's, right? So that's, that means it's really in one topic. Right, and that, that phrase it does make a lot of sense. Remember, this one has no human involved by any means. Okay, that means what you need is just go to Yelp review. Don't not see you are really Martians, right? <coughs> now, uh, if you look at it, you know, like uh, what here I just show you the Fraser segmentation. That means you go, for example, you look at San Antonio. Okay. So you actually look at the sand is one, 
Antonio is one, San Antonio is one. Actually, the Antonio is almost not existing because uh, you can see independent Antonio get 2,800, uh, but actually San Antonio get 23 something. That means the San Antonio almost trumped the Antonio. Uh, after that, Antonio, the, the Antonio's uh, count will become really low. Okay, so uh, so that that's uh, that's why when you try to do this, you look at sub sequence and super sequence. You try to get a complete one instead of get sub one. Okay, sub one. You know there are lots of sub ones. Actually, you can chop them off. And, but remember, this one is purely based on statistic signal without any human involvement. That means the human was completely out of the loop. Actually, people, once we generate this method, this one was done by, you know, uh, Erkishki, Ahmed Erkishki. Even in our own group, we said, this one is great, but why we do, cannot take any human input? Human knows something. Why you do not give, let human give you any hint? Okay. That immediately get into from the complete unsupervised to weakly and distantly supervised. What is weakly? Weakly means you just give a very tiny set of labels. Okay. How tiny it is? Suppose I get, give you the gigawatts. Okay. There are lots and lots of things. How many labels do you need? Actually, uh, Jalo, actually he tried, he just gives 300 labels. That means 150 as positive, 150 as negative. That almost any human can do it, right? You give that many labels, then you can do really, really good work. That's weakly supervised. What is distantly supervised? Distant supervised means I don't give any label, but somebody will give, some distant people will give. Who is distant one? Wikipedia or anything like this. Okay. That means we say if you want to work on a language, suppose Korean, you know nothing about Korean. Okay. How do you do it? You go to Wikipedia, the Korean version. Okay. They give you lots and lots of phrases. How do you find the phrases in Wikipedia? You, can, you think about how do you find phrases in Wikipedia. You go to, say, support vector machine and search, you can find an entry. You say, Barack Obama or Donald Trump, you can find an entry. Those are good phrases. They're already found by human being, right? Those are distant label. That means somebody in the world, somewhere they label it. I just use it. And how many labels you can get? 100,000, because they do have 100,000 entries. So those are the distantly labeled, distant supervised. And we actually explore those methods. You probably can see one is the sec phrase. Actually, this one is, is weakly supervised. One is the auto phrase, which is distant supervised. Let's see how we do it. Okay. Of course, once we say weakly supervised, we are going to introduce a classification inside because you, you do have positive labor, negative labor, you can do classif classification. And uh, what you need to label it just to say, you give a phrase, which may be good, may be bad. The good one, the human just put a one there, say this is a good phrase. The bad one, for example, you say the experiment shows. You say, oh, that's not worth it, okay. So you put a zero there. So what, that's all you need, okay. You just to give this one zero for 300, you know, candidate phrases then that's it. You can work on gigabytes, you know, corpus. And uh, so what you probably can see is what we consider, we do consider quality phrase. The quality actually is similar to what I just said about this quality. In the meantime, we have some kind of length penalty. Length penalty means we don't want to get too long. Sometimes the, the they get two long phrases, which actually may be a combination of two phrases or something. We actually have a length penalty once you get too long. But uh, of course, it depends on different corpus. For example, we tried on new source things, we set up a six. But if you really go to biomedical, like a PubMed, you probably have to set longer because the biomedical literature, sometimes the phrase is really long. Okay. We know that some kind of a name. The, 
like a non-small cell lung cancer or some kind of carcinoma. It's a very long one. It's just one phrase, right? So <laughs> then the process essentially is we actually do classification. That means we do, uh, we do do the frequency counting, but we feed into a classifier because we do have positive and negative. Because you have very small labels, what kind of classifier is the best? We actually tried it. We found a random forest is the best because random forest, actually, you have very small number of training data. You, you actually, because it's random, you, overall you do some kind of ensemble, you actually can get very good results. Okay. So uh, I will not get into very detail, but you probably can see the, 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 the result. This one is on the CKDD proceedings. We get a bunch of uh, proceedings online just to look at the title. So we got uh, uh, title and abstract. Actually, what we got, you probably can see, uh, the left-hand one is sec phrase got. The other one is non-phrase chunk, ch uh, chunk, chunking, NP chunking, non-phrase chunking. That's why we use the typical online NLP community, what they got. Okay. So you probably can see, uh, they do use some training, and uh, here, uh, sec phrase only give you like uh, 300 labels. What you can get here, you can see the red ones are the ones we can get, uh, non-freeze chunking cannot get, or at least rank very, very low. Those are the time series, gene expression data, frequent subgraph, or categorical attribute. Anybody working on data mining knows these are very, very important themes, actually, in, in data mining. They cannot find it. But they found something, you probably can see, important problem, effective way, small set. Those, uh, they found, those proceedings find this. We actually more or less dump them. It's like a stop words because it's almost occurring in any research literature, right? So you probably can see it does have some value. And actually it works for uh, multiple languages. We tried uh, Arabic because uh, Er Kishki actually is, knows Arabic. He, 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 he was born in Egypt, okay, so he knows a little. So he, he, we tried Arabic, we tried the Chinese, the phrase we generated very good. Okay. Then uh, uh, Jing Bo, you know, the first author of this tutorial, he says we still need a label. You still need to ask people to give 300 labels. Sometimes it's 300. You have to choose wisely. If you choose, if you randomly pick a 300 labels, may not be, work that well. Okay. Then we say, what about? We really don't want to give labels. Especially you get a new language. Suppose you get Italian, or you know, like uh, some other language, small ones. Okay. So you really do not know. You cannot give the labels. But we do have wiki. Right. What about we use wiki? Okay to get a lots and lots of positive labels because of the wiki entries or those uh, you know, links. Actually, they, they are actually the very good labels, but they are the positive labels. But there's a one problem is they don't give negative labels. Nobody say, what is not a phrase in Wikipedia? Wikipedia never say that, right? So then you think you find something wiki does not say, Within those wiki, you find some st statements. They do not say, you say, this is a bad phrase. Watch out. Sometimes it's a good phrase. They just do not have entry. Just give a simple example, okay? We tried it. Like Obama administration, okay? You think about it. Of course, we tried it before Obama stepped down, right? We tried Obama administration. It was not a wiki entry. Of course, it makes sense. It's a phrase, Obama administration or Trump administration. It definitely makes sense. But it's not anywhere in the wiki as an independent entry. So you probably can see, you can find hundreds, thousands of positive labels in Wikipedia. But if you randomly pick from Wikipedia, you think you get negative, send, uh, negative labels? Wrong. Okay. But we tried randomly. We found there are about 10%. If you randomly pick up those are not in the, in the wiki, there are 10%. Actually, they are phrases. They are reasonable phrases. 90% actually is not phrase. That means you find positive one, you find negative one, 
positive one, almost every one is high quality. You can find lots of them, okay? But negative one, watch out, 10% could be wrong. That means the negative labor, very noisy, 10%, okay? Can we do a good job with this? Actually, that's exactly, we focus on this. We say we want to get a label, but we don't have a negative label, okay? But how can we do this if we get a 10% steer noise, steer wrong one, okay? Actually, we found a very, very nice method in the sense is this. Because we have so many positive labels, you get hundreds, thousands of positive labels. You can partition them in any partition you like, right? You can, you can chop them into 10, into 20 different slots, okay? Then what you do is you get those negative one. The negative one you really sample from the wiki there, not any wiki entry, okay? You put it in. So you know you get a 100% right positive one, but you get 90% right negative one, noisy negative one. How could you handle it? Actually, what you do is, Vote, ensemble, you just think about this. If something get wrong, it's unlikely, all, if you partition them into 20, 20 groups, unlikely this 20 group you'll get a majority, okay, because the, 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 you only get 10%, you know, noisy negative label. So actually we use this ensemble on this. We found once you get large pool, the ensemble is very reliable. So you just ask them to vote, okay. So uh, we actually did a theoretical analysis on this, why this with a large positive pool and a noisy negative pool actually works well. We, uh, theoretically, we show it. Practically, we really want to show you is practically it really works. You probably see we, have, we encode this. EP means expert positive, DP means uh, distant training positive. The EM is uh, expert negative. DM is, uh, you know, like a distant negative. Okay, so we use this. We actually combine them. We see if you get enough label, that means you compete with human, I definitely give you a positive, definitely give you a negative. Okay, actually the human, you can see the EPEN in sec phrase, then simply says, I give you lots and lots of positive and negative one, the sec phrase will win. That means the labeled one will win. But remember, human cannot keep giving you hundreds, thousands of labels. That's not practical, okay? Now, once the labor got exhausted, that means you will say, I got tired. I cannot give you that many labels. Then you probably see immediately, you, you can see the, the line change it. Of course, in the middle, we have a gap. That means once you get a, like a 20,000 labels, okay, the human will give up, say, I cannot give you that many labels. Now you immediately see the, the noisy label, negative label one, the, the, the wiki one, will immediately win. Okay, that means as long as you exhaust your labor, we are the winner. Okay, so people can see that that's the trick. And actually, of course, you are going to also use for different languages, you need to a little tuning on how to get it. For example, Chinese, you actually have to, how to split them into the basic one. You, you need something to put in. The same thing as other languages, like German or Italian, you need to, to put it in. Okay, and with this, and also you judge the single words. That means, remember when you, when you rank the phrases, the single word you also think they could be a phrase because you want to compete. For example, Illinois or UIC, those are like a single word, but it actually does make sense, right? You, you want to get this, then we actually, this one is a little cloudy, but I probably should say this is the experiments I give you, the general one is, we actually use DBRP as scientific paper, Yelp as the social media one, then we get a news, we get a wiki. The wiki one, actually we, try, we took a English, Spanish, and Chinese. That means we took all these, we want to find all the high quality phrases. Remember, wiki give you like 20,000 quality phrase, positive phrases, 
but we want to find 100,000 or even more. Okay. How can you get this? So you probably can see uh, we actually do, did uh, the, this precision recall curve. If you look at the precision recall curve, no matter it's DBRP, ERP, or Spanish one, or Chinese one, you actually can see the last one is the Chinese one. The Chinese one, we compete with the best Chinese uh, one. We, uh, you, you probably can see precision recall is far ahead on any commercial, the Chinese one. Okay. So you simply say you, your statistic is really weak. Okay. And we actually show you some uh, examples. Anybody you can read Chinese, you probably can see even 90, uh, even to 100,000, you still get very high quality Chinese phrases. Okay. The English one, same. Okay. So uh, that's the one I probably want to introduce on the phrase mining. But uh, I think the best feature is you can download source code. You can really play with it. And uh, especially if you get familiar with other languages, you may want to try those languages. The only thing we haven't solved yet, which could be a good research topic, is what about those very small you know, population use language? We call rare language. Okay, you don't really have a good wiki, and the corpus is small. Okay, can we do good good work on the phrase mining? That one is still open. Okay, that, that means if you really work on those rare languages, we probably can discuss to see how we can develop method. But for popular languages, I think this one works really well. Okay, because you really have wiki for almost all those languages, right? OK, so I think we can uh, go over to the part two. I think Xiao is going to uh, continue on this part two. OK. So now that we have the um, basic semantic units that are um, sort of um, capture part of the structure of the text, which are the phrases that um, Zhao Wei just got in, just um, introduced. Um, next, we wanted to see whether we can find um, further, like sort of organize these semantic units, these phrases into some types. And I will talk about what are the types. Um, and then currently we are at these um, second steps from the phrase mining um, functional block. So as I just talked about, if we take sort of a closed domain point of view, we are going to do typing. And if we sort of have an open domain um, point of view, then we will be interested in see whether we can find out different bunch of attributes and their values here. And what are the types that I'm talking about? What are the types, entity, and relationships? So here's an example. This is a piece of um, hotel reviews from TripAdvisor. It's talking about a New York City um, Hilton Hotel, and when people read this piece of text, the first thing they want to find out is different types of entities. For example, hotel, this unigram, or this even you can think as a um, um, just just a word, but let's say Times Square is the phrase. So the hotel here is an organization. Times Square is a location, and Broadway shows is an event. So these are different types of entities, and then once they have these entities put into um, putting out from the piece of text, they would try to bridge these entities together with different types of relations. Like the Times Square is actually located near the hotel, and the hotel is close to the Broadway show. So entity um, typing and relation typing essentially is we want to um, go from things on the left-hand side where you already know this um, piece of text, and you know some other, what are the good phrases and quality um, phrases and, and the quality unigrants from this piece of text, we want to sort of a, um, label these entities with different colors or different types and want to label their relations um, or their edges with different um, relation labels um, as well. Um, as I talk about, the prior arts on solving these kind of problems, it's using a, a very repeated human efforts. So they take a workflow, go from asking human experts to annotate it and then using the annotation data as the training data to build up machine learning models and apply the machine learning models back to the corpus 
to get these type entities and type relations and so on. So some representative systems, including the Stanford's core NLP pipeline, uh, CMU's um, um, never-ending language learning, and UW's knowing our system, and so on. Um, and we want to sort of uh, change this into a diagram that we take some existing entity types and relation types from the, from the knowledge basis, which can be aligned with the corpus that you are interested in. So you have the Wikipedia can be aligned with news article because you know in the news article you are interested in person, name, location, organization, and you can find those bunch of entities in the Wikipedia or DBpedia. And if you're looking for different gene names, proteins, pathways, disease, you can find those sort of reference entities in the uh, corresponding biomedical knowledge base as well. And then you can use them to automatically annotate your corpus, build up the models, and apply the models back to the corpus. And to put this diagram into a bigger picture, we are part of the distance supervision um, learning this distance is supervised learning systems. And this is the lowest one in terms of the human efforts compared with other existing learning systems, starting from just handcrafting system, which you ask experts to just give you a, a rule, and you can just put the rule back to the corpus, and the rule is going to think about a regular expression. For example, those regular expressions just, just going to give you what, is, what are the good coffee names and, and what are the good restaurant names. And then people try to um, get rid of this very expensive rule crafting process by just giving examples of restaurant names and let the system to learn what would be the right rules and what would be the underlying good model for getting more a uh, name of the same kind. That's the supervised learning system. But further, people saying, okay, I just want to give you a couple examples, like tens of examples, hundreds of examples, but you still want, you still. Uh, it's expected to give me back very good um, annotated results, and that's how weekly supervised learning systems here. And as I talk about, the foundation of distance supervision is the existing knowledge basis. But we found out that the, the corpus can only be uh, matched with a very tiny portion with the knowledge basis. So we have to resolve these sparsity issues to propagate from the shadow part to the uh, vast majority of the um, this unshadow part um, to propagate this entity type information and the relation type information here. And the reason of this sparsity, and I also pointed out before, one is because the knowledge base is highly incomplete. Like we talk about this Junior's cheese case could be a restaurant name, but there's no Wikipedia page dedicated to it, so you have no idea what type of, uh, what is the right entity label, or entity type label for Junior's cheesecake? So you have to guess its type label by looking at other popular restaurants um, which have their records on Wikipedia or, DB, or Freebase. Um, another reason is current mapping techniques like the entity linking tools or entity resolution tools are still under development to a perfect stage. So we need to also um, be aware of the errors given, given by this any linking pipelines. So another thing is the label given by distance supervision is very noisy. Just give you an example here. United States at least been labeled with both um, location and government in the free base knowledge basis. So people, when they look at um, United States, they say, based on my past experience, experience in reading, um, in, in my own reading, I think People talk about United States as a location, but also talk about it as a government. Okay, that's generally true, but when you want to assign uh, the label to United States, this street name, this surface name, in a particular context, let's say New York City is my favorite city in United States, now the problem comes, are you gonna assign both of these labels to this particular sentence? And, and and this question is given to, the, to, the, to your algorithm, to your machine. Is the, is the algorithm knows which label is the right one based on the context? And, and, and based on current heuristics, when we assign these labels back to the uh, individual sentences, the algorithms actually are unaware of this context. So they basically put all the labels of United States back to every sentence that United States has been mentioned. So that's gonna introduce lots of false positive labels in this process. But that's how the current distance supervision technique um, has been done. And being, not, being known of such no label noise, it means we need to expand 
from the matchable part to the unmatchable part by kick, picking the right label to do the expansion. So that's the second technical challenge here. And um, the effort lies structured by, as we mentioned before, try to make very effective expansion by using the context units surrounding those entity names or the entity pairs as the bridges so that they can use um, like a graph propagation techniques or label propagation techniques to, to make this um, label to, 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 to sort of predict what are the right type label for those unmatchable part. And we need to design some specialized optimization problems where the objective function is aware of these noisy labels. So they sort of, we automatically pick the most likely label and only use that, lab, that label to supervise the, um, the algorithms to do the prediction. And this is done by using the data redundancy um, to make that happen. So I'm gonna introduce many on what can we, um, how we can learn different corporate specific models, I mean the entity typing models or relation typing models by um, starting with the partially labeled corpus. So the partially labeled corpus is essentially saying we have a, we have a raw corpus with, and it's, it's totally unlabeled, and then I apply distance supervision to map at, as many as possible things back to the corpus, which is just a tiny part compared to the entire corpus. And starting with that corpus with a tiny portion of label data, which now we call it partially labeled corpus, can I learn a very robust and a very um, generally um, effective model that can be applied back to the corpus, sort of predict what's the right entity types and what's the right relation types on the remaining, say, 80% of the sentences in the corpus. And I will talk about three specific structure mining tasks here. Starting from, okay, now we have the coordinate phrases. Can we predict the coarse grain entity types for those phrases? And then I want to refine those coarse grain types. Let's say you have, you have person, location, government, that's three coarse grain entity types. Now I want to look into the person. I want to say whether I can predict this is a sinner or the writer or the actor by looking at its surrounding context. That's a more five grand prediction. Um, and then using these entity types as the size signals, can we find out, okay, between this person and this location, their relationship in this sentence is, is, is actually like travel off, or it's actually born in, or, or like birthplace or death place and so on. That's the relation extraction. So the entity extraction, or what NLP people mostly call them, name entity recognition task, it's a pretty well started task, but it's still a very, um, um, very challenging task in terms of what people have achieved so far. So think about you, get, you are given a piece of um, Yelp's review and you are, again, a Martian, that you just know this is a sequence of characters that doesn't mean anything to you. And now I give you a dictionary. The dictionary is recording some of the full names on our earth and some of the location names and restaurant names, for example. And using the dictionary uh, where you know, okay, this bunch of character sequence actually are labeled as food, are labeled as location, can you make guess, okay, can you go from the left side to the right side by predicting, okay, barbecue is also a food and poopock sandwich is a food as well. And the Phoenix is location here. This is very challenging parts for our computational system. So think about the dictionary may contain um, baked beans or coleslaw, but may not talk about anything about poopock sandwich. You need to do inference now. You need to inference, so okay, by seeing, by knowing coleslaw and baked beans are food, can you also sort of guess poopock sandwich is, is also a kind of food um, on, the, on the earth. And for the barbecue, you can see here, it's another very challenging example because the dictionary are likely a, a, um, storing multiple entries for BBQ this string. One of them could be the food name, the other one could be just acronyms for the companies on our earth. And how do you know this is this barbecue in the first sentence is actually a food name, but it's actually a food but not a company, and so on. So there's a disambiguation problem for our computational system. But doing this in a very efficient and high quality way gonna just 
empower so many exciting things. Like just think about if, if you can link these entities, if you can put these entities into the right bucket, then you can just assign very spe special um, engines for each bucket to sort of uh, dig out more information about these entities. And these kind of problems in the context of nature language processing has been um, formalized as sequence tagging or sequence labeling problem. And the sequence labeling problem is essentially saying, okay, now I break down the sentence into every single token. And the problem becomes you need to classify a token into the right label. For example, you want to classify barbecue into food, you want to classify Phoenix as location, and the remaining tokens is classified as all which is out of entity boundary. That means it's not entity. Um, and when they're classifying these tokens, they are looking at the features of the token itself and its surrounding tokens plus the predict labels of their surrounding tokens. So again, this becomes a very complex um, training and inference process, which is all to the n square, where n is the number of the tokens in the sentence. But the more importantly, I think the training process, I, the annotation process by the human experts is a very time consuming and error prone process. So here's just an interface for human to annotate the right kinds of label data to train those sequence models. The experts is asked to just read this sentence token by token and put the right boundary on those tokens and color those boundary with the right types. Like here, you can see there's green, red, and yellow color, different kinds of boundary. Um, and this is just annotating four kinds of entities. But think about in, the, in, in, in biomedical domain, when you need to deal with hundreds or thousands of different fine-grained biomedical entity types, is our human experts gonna have very subjective judgments on every single token when they're looking at this interface? And how do you deal with those um, subjective errors introducing by this annotation process? So that those are all like open questions here. And the distance supervision is saying, okay, we're gonna use knowledge-based facts to generate this label data, and we, uh, we are aware of, of these errors gonna be introducing this process. So we're focusing on building the robust model to take care of those errors. And let me first introduce what is the workflow of distance supervision here. So you're starting with detect, um, the sentence where those entity names or the phrases has already be, been detected and highlighted. So in the first sentence, you know Phoenix and New York City are two entity names that you are focusing on. Um, to sort of type them. Um, and then I put all these entity names over here as the data points. The next thing is you do matching or entity linking or disambiguation. So now you, you, you try to check whether barbecue, this stream, can be mapped back to an entry in the Wikipedia. And if so, you are, then you know, okay, the entity ID maybe I, uh, entity 100 is can be mapped to barbecue this string, and you just grab the type label in the entity of the entity 100 and assign it back to this string. So now you know, okay, barbecue in this sentence um, is labeled as food, this entity type. Same thing happened for the New York City, it's labeled as location. And as I said, there's a vast majority of the entities still remain unlabeled because they are unmatchable. Either is because they are underlying entity, the real entity doesn't be stored in our knowledge base is all because our anti-linking is just give you a very low confidence score that you are, it's sort of untrustworthy, so you just give up uh, putting the label for them. So now the remaining thing is you need to propagate information from the labeled entity data points to the remaining question marks. And this has to be done by setting up bridges as I talk about. The bridges here, we are using different relation phrases or verb phrases that start with some um, verb and end it with either preposition or just some nouns, like barbecue, taste in Phoenix, and Phoenix is my all-time favorite dive bar in New York City. These are all been automatically extracted using our phrase mining techniques from those original sentences you can see on the, um, on, on the right top part. 
So now you just need to find out the right um, models that can propagate information from those colored points to those great color points um, by doing sort of a label propagation. Now the problems comes. It seems like we have a pretty straightforward algorithm to sort of a go do things from the matchable part to the unmatchable matchable part, and it seems all, all problems solved. But the third thing we observe is the name ambiguity issues. So recall that here in this pic picture, Phoenix is always a single node in our gigantic entire um, graph that we constructed from the original corpus. But the Phoenix here is carrying multiple semantic meanings. Just give you an example here, we have three sentences where Phoenix, these string names has been mentioned, but it's actually talking about two real world entities. The first and the third sentence talking about Phoenix is actually talking about a bar in New York City. And the second one is talking about a Phoenix city in the Arizona state. But then once you sort of decide to just use a one single data point to model this Phoenix, it means at the end of the day, you either just give a, sing give a single label to these data points, or you just assign a distribution over all the type labels that you are considering. And you're just representing this, this using this distribution to representing how likely this Phoenix is a city, or it's a um, organization, or a restaurant, and so on. But that's not the best things we want. We want every occurrence of the Phoenix has been accurately typed with a single label, and, and the best thing is we can 100% sure, okay, this phoenix the, in this first sentence or the third sentence is actually the organization, but the second one is a location. So that's something we want to adjust here. How do you deal with the, um, the prediction in a very context-aware way? Second, you can see we're using bridges to propagate information from one to the other, but the bridges is sort of very sparse in the sense that people have a wide variety of way in talking about relationships between two entities. When they want to say, even, they, even if they want to say Phoenix is sort of a dive bar in New York City, they can have a way, like in sentence one, they can say it's my all time favorite dive bar in, but they, okay, they also can be saying um, it becomes my uh, favorite bar in New York City. There's slight difference between these two strings, but human read it, they know there's a semantic relationship between them, but the computer algorithms sort of are unaware of this, so they was treated as two separate bridges. And so this means if we can let the algorithm know these two bridges will be sort of a merge in some circumstances, then our propagation algorithm will be more effective. And I will talk about that point very shortly. So, as I, talk, as, as, I, as I mentioned, the first thing is we want to detect the entity names from the sentences like the Phoenix, the New York City, and so on. And this is done by um, making a, a small tweak to the phrase mining algorithms we just, got into, we just talked about. So phrase mining algorithms is mainly using the corpus level concordance and many other um, statistic signals um, um, to um, find out what would be the most likely corp, uh, phrase, good phrases in the corpus. But then, when we talk about entities, it means it's just a subset of the good phrases we are considering. You also have very good verb phrase or relational phrases and many other kind of things. So how can we narrow down the scope for the algorithms to only focus on entity names so we play the check, what we call um, synthetic quality here, as you can see in the green box. The synthetic quality is essentially, we ask a human, what do you think is the right regular expressions if you're using part of speech tag um, to form a regular expression? What would be the good one for you to pick the entity names from the sentences? So the human think, okay, um, for entity names, maybe I want to use just consecutive nouns or adjective plus some consecutive nouns. But for verb phrase, I can have anything start with a ver um, verb and end it with a preposition, or start with a verb plus a bunch of other stuff and end it with a preposition. So now, given this human prior knowledge on language, we can sort of partition quantitative phrases into two subsets. One is verb phrase or relation phrase, the other one is entity, entity phrases. 
using this synthetic quality, we basically, it's like we have a gate that we can switch between these two kinds of things. And we can multiply this gate to our traditional quality phrase measurement, and it becomes a entity detection algorithm. And you can see example here, now we can sort of partition this sentence um, by running exactly the same inference algorithms of our phrase mining, but now, we, since we have to switch, the switch gonna give you some binary labels on those phrases. The red color means it's entity names, like barbecue, phoenix, poop box sandwich. The blue color means it's verb phrase or relation phrase, so you have taste in, like serve up, in west of, and so on. That's a pretty interesting extension of the phrase mining to sort of empower this entity detection. And starting from here, um, I want to just use a big picture to sort of uh, go through the intuition of our class type algorithm, which try to address the two issues we talk about. One is the sparsity um, of the entities, um, and the, the, other, the sparsity of the relation phrases or the, or the sparsity of the bridges. The other one is the ambiguity of the entity names. So as you can see, the, towards the solving the ambiguity of the entity names, very straightforward, we want to just use different data points to represent different phoenix in the previous example. So phoenix in the sentence one, two, three now is separated into three um, data points here, but we still want to um, link some of these phoenix together because by looking at their surrounding context, we know these two phoenix is very alike each other versus the other, so linking them together sort of help you to better propagate things in a faster, in a, in a faster speed. And then we still map this entity mentioned back to their surface form or the string name because we try to observe how these string names are co-occurring with their verb phrases or the relation phrases in the entire huge corpus. And as I mentioned, we do know some of these relation phrases, they are semantically similar. And if merging them, we're gonna help you to propagate things be between one another. So we're doing clustering of this entity, I'm um, sorry, doing clustering over these relation phrases together with the propagation process. And I will just, uh, and the reason is merging them together help the propagation, and propagation provides sign signals to merging them because propagation give you um, an initial prediction on the type label of their surrounding context. And those type labels is also a sign signals to help you merge this relation phrase together. So basically we are multitasking two things. One is the label propagation on the graph that we built here with three kinds of nodes. One is the entity mention nodes on the top and the entity name nodes in, in the middle layer and, and the relation phrase nodes on the left side. There's a propagation between one another using these bridges, but we're also doing the clustering of those relation phrases sort of resolve this sparsity issue. And just to give you some results that how our system, the class type, is compare, um, uh, it's performed comparing with some um, traditional um, name entity recognition systems. So here's the experiment setup. So we, as we, as we said, we are using distance supervision to annotate um, um, the corpus, the training corpus. So all of these systems was trending on the same training corpus that was automatically annotated using Freebase as the background knowledge basis. So we basically, um, let's say we are focused, in each of the data sets, we have a focused um, entity type set. For example, for New York Times, we are focusing on person, location, organization, um, event. And for Yelps, we are focusing on food, um, like job titles, location, organization, and so on. So each of these data sets has, has, a, has a defined it, finite set of uh, fixed entity types. And we're using these entity types to go back to the free base to find out all bunch of the entities that belong into this category and map, try to map as many of these entities back to the training corpus. So you can automatically annotate the training corpus with many entity names of person, of location, and so on. And then we use that to train all the systems. So the systems can be, can be sort of uh, partitioned into three kinds. I mean the baseline system. One is just doing bootstrapping. So they, the bootstrapping system gonna just use one data points to represent all the Phoenix mentions. So it's not taking care of the name ambiguity issue here. 
And the label propagation algorithm compared to that become a little, uh, become a bit more smart, it become a bit smarter because they separate these different data points for different, uh, for different Phoenix, but then they, have, they do nothing to overcome the relation phrase sparsity issue. So they are not merging those bridges together. And the classify with linguistic feature, this figure from the UW is a very uh, special baseline that we compare because it's a very linguistic baseline. It just trained a very simple logistic regression over uh, um, tens of different linguistic features, including dependency parts and the part of speech tag and so on. So the point that we compare with this system is trying to show it's very, this such system is very effective given a very good quality um, features. But once you have problem to getting good linguistic features in the data sets that you are dealing with, its performance just gonna drop dramatically. So the figure using dependency structure, those all kind of things was pretended on news articles and web blogs, very standard benchmark data sets that NLP people are playing with, but then they are not playing with Yelps and Twits that much. So there's very limited resource in training dependency parser part of speech tagger and so on for those domains. So this basically shows you by switching between different domains in a very fast pace, that's most likely the use case for many of you here, it's unreliable to, to depend on those very sophisticated linguistic classifier. And the class type, since it's just using very simple phrase mining um, system to get those entity names and relation phrases to build up the huge graph, and doing the propagation and clustering on those graphs, we can achieve such a performance. A sort of demonstrate its domain independence, and furthermore, we are working on the language independence of this system as well, since the, the language independence has already been implemented for our phrase mining system. So now, we have no problem in finding the fragment types for the NT. So for example, you read this sentence, it's talking about Donald Trump spent some television seasons at NBC. So you have no problem to ask any of the systems, including class type, to sort of uh, make the prediction, okay, this sentence is talking Donald Trump as a person, not a location organization. But in many use cases, you want to dig out more about an entity. Like in this case, if you are given a very complicated type hierarchy um, in advance, let's say you have a hundred of entity types that are organized into a tree structure where even under person you have politicians, businessmen, artists, and under artists you have writer, actor, and singer, and so on. Now I'm asking the same question. Can you type Donald Trump in this sentence with this type hierarchy in a in as fine grain as possible. So the best case is you give me a very, you give me a single type path, which is highlighted in the red color here, that can best describe Donald Trump's um, type in this sentence. So the ideal output would be, he's a person, he's an artist, he's an actor, by reading the context, okay, he's doing something on the TV shows, he's um, there. So this, will, this is the problem statement of fiber entity typing. We, we, we are given a type hierarchy, we are given this entity with its surrounding sentence as the context. Can you predict a single path in the type hierarchy, in the tree, that best describes its nature? And it, it's, it's becoming even more challenging when you place this problem setting um, in the distance supervision context. So we call that distance supervision as Given this, sorry, given these entity names, we map it back to the entity entrant in the knowledge basis. And we try to grab all the types about the entity and map it back to every place this entity has been mentioned. So now Donald Trump has been labeled as person, politician, artist, businessman, and many other types by the human crowds. They keep adding that into the Wikipedia. I believe it will be more in the future um, if we have a better type hierarchy to sort of characterize this um, Terraprise scheme. And, and now it's gonna generate a training sample like this. So it's in sentence one, Donald Trump's, it will be labeled as all these bunch of type labels. Um, and, and in traditional setting, this training samples is just, just, just gonna be fit into the downstream machine learning pipelines to 
China neural network and do a prediction. Now you know many of these type labels are false positive. Um, can you design a better model to select the right model to um, train the other um, components of your machine learning system? So that's our um, that's the starting point of our um, um, projects here. So the first thing we do is we do what we call label noise reduction. This is very general function uh, component. We just try to make a, f a functional block where you give me a noise, a, a, a training example with very noisy labels, I can output a training example with clean labels so that you can do whatever you want with that training examples. Um, basically, you can see Donald Trump's here is given as input, so we first extract a bunch of text features surrounding this Donald Trump's in that sentence, and we're gonna get rid of the author, businessman, and politician, which are the false positive labels here, and we, we hand it back to you so you can train a logistic regression or a very complicated deep neural nets. And the basic idea behind this label noise reduction uh, module is what is, is, is an embedding technique that we call partial label embedding. The partial label embedding is, is very nice in the sense that, it, again, it has a switcher. The switcher is about, if I know this is a clean, lab, clean, clean um, examples, then I will use such a heuristic to do the um, optimization. And if it's a noise examples, I'm gonna use the other objective, which is noise aware objective to do the optimization. So here the problem comes, how do you know example is noisy or not? So we have a little bit of assumption here. So what we do is, let's say you give me an example with its type label like person and politician. We place it back to this hierarchy here, and if we observe that becomes a, very, a single type pass, we think it's a clean label because you don't observe any conflicts. But in the example of Donald Trump's, you can easily see this is a subtree here over the entire type hierarchy. The subtrees means you have a very, you have conflicting sibling types, so you have to make it, you sort of need to reduce this subtree into a single pass, and that's exactly the the label noise reduction goal. So for clean examples, we have the objective to rank the positive examples to be higher than any other negative examples. So person and politician, these two positive examples will be ranked higher than any other things like location, organization, and so on. But for noise examples like Donald Trump's you just seen in the, in the sentence, we design an objective function, what we call partial label loss function. It's gonna first pick the most likely positive examples because we know among all these positive examples, there's only one or a few more will be correct, while the remaining ones is just false positive. So we sort of rank this actor to be the top one and only use this actor as the supervision. And we try to um, rank these actors to be higher than the, all the other negative examples where you have the singer, coach, doctor, and so on. So how we pick these best candidate types? The basic idea is you can, if you have a representation of type label, and if you have a representa representation of this entity mentioned, then you can sort of rank these candidate, candidate types by the similarity of these two representation. And that representation has been kept updated while we, um, while, while we try to iterate um, um, between these two things, between updating the embedding uh, of those entities and the, the types and updating what is the most likely label for those entities. So it's more like an EM, EM diagram that we iterate between these two to finally converge to the right label we should pick among this set of uh, noisy labels. And the byproduct of this process is a pretty nice embedding space, as you can see here. Let's say the red color here is, is representing the label, the type label. You have politician, um, person, doc, actor, and the uh, uh, blue squares are, are those entity uh, mentions surrounding features. So you have play, you have star, you have gay, and things close to each other means they have very similar type 
types. So now, with this embedding space, you actually have the predictive power. It means that for any unseen sentence and entities, you can predict what are the most likely, uh, most appropriate type label for that entity. Now given this sentence, say President Trump gave an all hands uh, address to the troops at the um, headquarters, let's say even you replace these Trumps with my name, I'm still gonna, gonna make the prediction just using their surrounding context. So I'm using president, using give, using address, go back to this space, I can grab their embedding vectors. I just take the average of these embedding vectors to sort of have a, rep, a, a, a intermediate representation of this Trump in the sentence. I bring this vector back to the space. I look at what is the nearest neighbor um, type labels. And I can do, do this in a recursive way in the given hierarchy to finally predict, okay, this Trump is actually a person and politician based on the context. So we compare this predict, prediction process with some of the existing fine grained entity typing system. And those systems haven't done um, things like what we done, in, uh, haven't done the label noise reduction um, process like what we did for this, um, um, what we just introduced. So it basically used all the possible labels that you get from the distance supervision to train their machine learning models. So basically you are taking all the false positive labels as perfect labels to train your model. It's gonna be pretty noisy, especially on the fine grain type level, like the level three you can see here. So now we have this fine grain type label of the entities. We can further think about how to bridge things together um, to sort of know what are the relationships between two entities. And the, the way that people have been doing this relation extraction, as I say, they put it into a very later stage. So there's a bunch of things they need to finish before they get into the relation extraction. So the first thing is they need to detect the entity mansion. And then they need to type the entity mansion like what we just, just done. And then they finally um, try to figure out, okay, between a pair of entities, like between Donald Trump's and United States, is there gonna exist a relationship? So that's a binary classification problem. And if you solve this binary classification problem, the next problem is, if, it's, if there's indeed a relationships, what types of the relationship um, you can observe on the sentence? And then you, you, you're basically gonna solve a multi-class classification problem now. The, 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 the point here is trying to say, this is a very incremental process, process uh, system pipeline, but you will observe errors in any of the stage. So the error is gonna be aggregated and propagated throughout this cascading pipeline, and if the error just happened in the very initial stage, like you have a wrong prediction on Donald Trump is a person, you actually predict it as a location, then um, just consequently you will see all the things has been messed up in those system. The idea here, um, from our point of view, is trying to make corrections um, happen between these stages. So if you take an end-to-end -end, um, training process, you basically can correct the wrong labels you assign to Donald Trump's if you know, okay, it's co-occurring with a location, United States. So it's very unlikely something on the left side of a location is is, is some other types. So that's the base idea. We, we want to do a joint typing of the entity and the relationships. And here's the overview idea. So what you already seen is something like the bottom part. You have the entity names connect to their uh, features. You have the entity being assigned with their labels. Some of the labels in this, in, in this dash lines means they are unreliable labels, but that's unaware to our um, Machine, I mean computational machines. Now in a similar way, you can build up something for relation mention. So between Barack Obama and United States in sentence one, you can find out a bunch of features in these green color um, circles and you can also label them using the distance supervision idea. Now you can also bridge these two parts together because you know, okay, US is an entity argument of the relation mention, Barack Obama, US in sentence one. So you now have a very gigantic graph, but now what we want to play is we want to get two embedding space, two vector space. One is for entities, one is for relations. The reason we want to make two spaces is we want to have predictive power on both entity and relation. So the predictive power is same as what we've seen before. 
if I'm give you a new sentence talking about two entity names, and I give you a bunch of features extracted from that sentence, can you tell me what relation types those two entity are expressing? So making two embedding space can um, support such um, needs. And just want to give you a little bit more detail on how these things has been modeled. So between the entities, between the um, relation mentioned, entity, entity mentioned, and their features, you, have, you can observe a bipartite graph. Basically, it's capturing the coherence between these two, two things in a huge corpus. So you will expect if Donald Trump's United States in sentence seven has these features, so those edges will just carry the weight one. Otherwise, it's zero. Um, and we're using the second order proximity, which is pretty standard heuristic, uh, pretty standard intuition that if these two nodes in the graph share many labors, then these two nodes should have very similar representation. Base, here is basically saying if these two, these two relation mentioned have very similar features, then they should have a, they should be carrying the same relation types. And now the problem comes. We assign these relation labels to those um, pair of entity names in the sentence. The relation label, again, is using distance supervision to generate. So you're going to bring a lot of false positive labels in this stage. For example, between Donald Trump's United States, you can observe present of leaving and born in. They are all valid relation types in the free base. But then in this particular context, only one of them is correct. Now, again, we take out this weapon, what we call partial label loss. It's going to just push the present of to be the things we need to consider and put away the other false positive types. And we, make a, we, we design a loss function that enforce the margin only between present of of the entity, uh, between the present of and the other negative, uh, negative examples. So basically, we are not considering anything in the, in the white color. We try to get rid of those noise. That can use some uh, max margin formulation, something like this, to sort of realize this assumption. And finally, we need to bridge the entity and relation together, as we mentioned. This is done by using the translating assumption that you may be familiar with um, in those Trans-C paper, um, the NIPS, 19, um, NIPS um, 209 paper by Bordes. So they're basically saying between um, two entity names like Washington DC and USA, if I, if I have a relation between them, which, which I guess is the capital city of, then they should form a triangle um, relations in their low dimensional vector space. So basically, uh, Washington DC's vector plus this relations vector should be the um, linear neighbor of the other USA's vector. And this can be done by using a, a very uh, um, a similar max margin functions here as well. So, th so the code type, the joint extraction of the entity and relations is basically bringing all this intuition together in a joint optimization problem where you type the entity mentions and the relation mentions using what, what we just talked about. But you also bridge these two things together using the translating assumption as the in intuition. And you can do a, a, a very effect, efficient optimization using stochastic gradient descent to sort of a predict, to get those two embedding space, one for entity and one for relations. And we do a little bit study on the performance compared with other relation extraction system, especially the system that they just do relation extraction, but not using any size signals from the entity type part. And you can observe the gap between the blue line and the gray line is, is actually showing, um, sorry, um, the, the gap between the green line and the blue line is actually the gap that's showing if you are using entity, um, if you are optimizing the entity embeddings together, you will have such a performance gain between the green line and the blue line. So I further try to validate whether the partial label loss is useful in terms of getting the right label to supervise the system. So we, we present the gap between the blue line and the gray line. And you can see, especially when the recalls go up, we can still preserve a, a decent um, 
precision, while the other system just have a dramatic drop um, on the precision here. And this is the joint extraction of any case relations, which means we have the opportunity to start from a raw corpus with a background knowledge basis. We can sort of uh, mine the entity names, type the entity names, and bridge this entity together and type the relations between them. This essentially is a construct, a very initial stage knowledge graph out of any corpus if you have a reference knowledge base. So very, very interesting showcase is in the biomedical domain, you have so many good reference knowledge bases. Can you starting from the knowledge bases and the entire PubMed corpus, which is 25 million PubMed abstracts, plus 10% of them have the full text. Um, can you build up a much larger knowledge graph, which is a superset, it's a super superset of what you already have in the mesh in the UMLS in many gene ontology, disease ontology. And, and using this knowledge graph, can you help people better navigate the knowledge in the biomedical domain, in the life science domain? So the first thing we, we design here is we give user a new interface to explore the biomedical literature. So now given this knowledge graph underlying, and we already index the papers with those knowledge, with using the knowledge graph. So user now can just give me two entity types they are interesting of. For example, they're interesting of a particular heart disease and gene. Now I first visualize you with a bipartite graph between this heart disease and the genes. You have a bunch of entities between them. And I allowed you to click on any of these nodes or edges between them. So when you clicked on them, basically I show you a bunch of papers that are most relevant to this fact or this structure. And you can just, basically it means you can using the, the underlying entities and relationships between the entities to navigate the knowledge instead of just inputting a bunch of key phrase or match term, which, is, which you have been using for years in the PubMed um, search engine. The amazing thing is the efficiency compared to what we had 10 years ago. Building a knowledge graph is people have all put in efforts on. So 10 years ago, there's a bunch of experts want to just build a protein-protein interaction network with 95, 94 different kinds of protein-protein interactions. But it took them over 2,500 man hours to just put together around 3,000 facts or edges, such a PPI network. But nowadays, with this code type system and a bunch of other um, dependent systems, we can operating on lots of PubMed papers. But most importantly, we are operating on much bigger number of types on entities and on relations. So this is very heterogeneous network and very large scale network. But it can be done within just one hour on a single machine. Um, and if you're asking about the performance of our system in how accurately we can provide the type labels. We did a little study on just using what we construct to evaluate on the PPI, the protein-protein interaction domain. And we have a classification, classification accuracy over 94 PPI relationships, is, which is 66.661.7. So there's still a huge gap to improve. But at least we, we show you that the efficiency we can sort of trade off makes lots of things become possible. And now we talk about distance supervision. But there's many other ways of giving indirect supervision. For example, you can give me a regular expression to extract coffee names or extract what is the, bond, what is the birthplace of some from person, what is the death place of some person. So basically, we, we now try to generalize the concept of indirect supervision to a, a more general way that the supervision could be a knowledge-based fact, the supervision could be human rules, could be a crowd worker, and so on. And we are calling them labeling function. So the heterogeneous supervision means we are dealing with different kinds of labeling function, and we are focusing on making, um, to making the estimation on how good an, a labeling function can work, and what is the expertise set of those labeling function. For example, to annotate born in, you can use rules like, you can use knowledge base 
things, things like if you observe these two entities has a bonding relations, you can basically annotate the corpus using these two entities many, many times as long as you observe they co-occur in, in a sentence. But you can also design a rule, like heuristic pattern, like the, the lambda three here, that if you observe a string born in, then you annotate these two entities, the entities on the two sides as born in relations. So now, it's very easy to generate a large number of rules or a large number of um, um, labeling functions by either um, like declarative information extraction system or just using knowledge bases. So now you will face the situation that on one data point, you will have multiple labeling functions given different labels. So there's conflicts, there's duplicates, and what would be the right label given this context? So there's lots of work has been done along this line in the crowdsourcing, in the truth finding literature but most of them adopting an assumption which we call source consistent assumption, which saying a one labeling function has only a single expertise score. If it's 50% accuracy, it's gonna be 50% accuracy on all the instances it's working on. And it's, if it's 0% accuracy, it's gonna be just a, a garbage that it, it's, gonna, gonna, it's not gonna give you any right label to any data points. But this is obvious not the case we know as a crowd worker or as an experts, we have our expertise sets. We're gonna do, for me, I'm gonna do good at computer science concept in machine learning concepts, but I'm gonna be giving the garbage labels to biomedical things I can see. So we want to mimic these things in our framework. We want to give each labeling function a expertise set or what we call, um, we want to give them a proficiency set and we want to sort of estimate this proficiency set together with their labels. So the basic idea of this recursion framework is we do choose discovery while we modeling the, uh, we, we try to uh, estimating a relation extraction. So these are basically the work that we've been working on uh, along the line of typing entities and relations. So I think before we go into the next section, we, we are already in the break section. So sorry for dragging you on this break. So we will come back later at 10.30.